Hi, healthy humans. Welcome to the Healthy Human Project. My name is Melissa Uchida, and this is a place where everyday people like you and me are taking small steps in the direction of complete, total health and well being. We take responsibility for our own health and we do everything that we can, one small step at a time, in order to help ourselves and our families reduce suffering. And by doing that, we then spread reducing suffering by increasing health and well being, all in free, totally natural. Don't need to buy anything. You don't need to go anywhere. You just need to um, take away one little nugget, make one small little action, do it consistently. And um, through that, we are able to transform our lives. Today, we're talking about grief. Now, what is grief? Grief is one of those powerful emotions that it whacks you right over and you go, I don't even know how I got here and I really don't want to be here. Grief is called the great transformer. It comes from a French word and it means an injustice, suffering, um, pain, calamity, hardship. There is this feeling of total unfairness and powerlessness when we feel grief. Now, grief usually comes, we think about it, usually when someone dies, someone passes, they transition to the other side, and we, we go, oh, that is grief, that person is grieving. But we can have grief on so many other ways. There can be grief because of a breakup, because of estrangement, because of a move, because of a disappointment, because of a, a loss of identity, a loss of a career, a loss of a dream, all of these things we grieve. So grief is not to grieve, a grief is not like one size fits all. There are all different kinds of grief. But what's important that we as a society understand what grief is, we know it, we are able to identify it in ourselves and to take the steps toward healing. And we're also able to identify it in other people and we can help them to take small steps toward healing as well. I really do believe that I didn't even know what grief was until my husband died. I had I had never used the word. I didn't understand it. And I didn't understand how an emotion could be so incredibly painful and powerful. So that's why I believe it's in, so important for us to be talking about grief because our world is grieving. We're coming out of a pandemic and not only the pandemic did we lose lots of people, but there's a whole mental health crisis and a whole health crisis happening right now that um, we're gonna lose more people. So it's my goal that we can reduce some of the suffering, that we can take small steps that are free, that are within our power to be able to reduce human suffer suffering and to increase our health and well being. And if we start with ourselves and with our families, then it can spread. So if we if we take the responsibility and say, I am going to start by healing my own, um, whether it's grief or whether it's something else that we talk about. But today we're talking about grief, whether I can identify grief within myself and work toward healing it for me, for my family, for my children, and then just by doing that, it will start to spread. So that's my intention with the Healthy Human Project. We look at, I look at human health in terms of five domains. That's physical health, mental, emotional health. I group those two together, even though they could be separate, but mental and emotional, the thoughts and the feelings. Spiritual health, faith is such an incredibly important part of the human experience and it is definitely like um, god's elixir it's a way for us to um, increase our health and our resilience simply by giving ourselves permission to believe in something that we can't see to believe in a higher power and that can be any higher power of your choosing and then energetic uh, health and that is all the stuff that we can't see that's other than spirit but it's our energy our bio field our aura the energy that surrounds us and we all know that right when we bump into someone energetically and go ooh, um which we've all been there. So, and environmental health, because as human beings, we're not separate from our environment. We live in this environment. If we think of a fish being in the water, um, if the water is sick, the fish is gonna be sick. We're the exact same way. So what's in our environment that could be making us sick or that could be increasing our health? So when it comes to grief, 
we're going to acknowledge that grief is uh, can happen for so many different reasons. And we're just increasing our awareness of that. Last Friday was National Grief Day. I didn't even know that that was a thing. And my grief mentor mentioned that in a Facebook post or an Instagram post, and I didn't even know it. So it really is a about increasing our awareness of this realm of things that human beings go through and to understand that we're in a period of grief all across the planet. And so when we understand that, we can help to bring healing. Yeah. Okay, there's nothing wrong with grieving. Grieving is completely natural. It's normal. When something's been taken from us, when we feel an injustice, whether that is our sense of dignity, whether that is a loved one, whether that is a sense of fairness, whether that is um, the loss of a relationship, there's a powerlessness and it's important for us to grieve. So Grief is called the great transformer. And that is because the realm of emotions that go in with grief and with grief, we'll talk about what the stages of grief are, but know that there are emotions. There is sadness, powerlessness, injustice, anger, resentment, unfairness. Um, so here's my, I wish I could read that far, but my feelings chart is over there. So many emotions that go into this grief, despair, loneliness, hopelessness. And so when we understand that all of this is normal, then we don't have to go, oh my gosh, I feel so badly and I don't know why I feel so badly. No, you've been robbed of something. You feel powerless about something. There is a loved one or a relationship or a, a life thing that has been taken from you and it feels absolutely horrible. So the emotions that go along with this are completely normal. And if anyone tries to make you feel otherwise, they're wrong. I want you to know that it's normal and that you are not alone. Okay. Now the types of grief, here's normal grief. Now I say normal grief, but there is no one size of grief. Okay. But just normal grief, something has happened. An event has happened. A loved one is gone. Person you care so deeply for is no longer in your life for whatever reason. And you're going to be sad. You'll feel despair. You'll feel hopeless at times. You'll feel angry. You'll feel um, confused. All completely normal. Okay. <clears throat> powerless. That's a really big one. And then there's anticipatory grief. That's that we know someone is dying. Someone is sick that they are going to be leaving this planet in this human body. And so we're anticipating the feeling of not having them here. Then there's complicated grief. Now this is when there is sudden death or trauma, complicated grief, death by suicide, death by addiction, um, death by murder. That's complicated grief. Death by a, a, a big unexpected event. That's, there's complicated grief. There will be all these things that go along with that. And so know that with complicated grief, that there is more in that grief. It can take longer to heal that grief. And so um, be kind and, and be patient with yourself. Have lots and lots and lots of compassion for yourself if you're going through complicated grief. And then there's disenfranchised grief. And this is grief that's not recognized by society. And I would say that most grief isn't recognized by society. I was actually really floored when my husband died by suicide three years ago. I was floored that I felt so much support from people. Um, and I also was so in my own grief that I, I didn't even notice really what was going on, but I felt like I had a lot of people holding me, holding space for me. Now, I think that's unusual. And for the most part, when there is grief, like especially if there is death by suicide or if there is death by murder or if there is a um, even grief through divorce, I mean, holy smokes, the divorce process is that anyone that's been through divorce knows the terrible system, the terrible legal system that you have to go through and how there's this pitting against each other. Plus they add all of this fear. There's so much fear that goes around in, in that process. There's a whole lot of grief and it's not recognized and people are generally not supported. So 
when we have disenfranchised grief, you can also get that with miscarriage, with abortion, with stillbirth. People don't want to talk about it because they're uncomfortable. So it's disenfranchised grief. You don't get the support that you need because other people are really uncomfortable about it or maybe they don't believe, they don't agree with decisions, they don't agree with how you do things. And so you end up with disenfranchised grief. Now, we live in a society where most people don't understand grief and aren't recognizing grief. However, over the past several years, since the pandemic, um, we have, we have amazing teachers like David Kessler, who is a grief expert, and his mentor was Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who's now on the other side, but people who study um, death and dying and have written books and really and are out there speaking about grief because it is so incredibly powerful. So the more that we talk about grief, the more people know that it's a thing and go, oh, wait a second, because there's not a single person on this planet that will go through life without experiencing grief. That's something that we know as a human being, you will experience if you haven't already. And my guess is that you probably have to some degree at some point in your life, but you might not have known that that was grief, okay? Or is grief. So just know that it's a very natural human emotion and every single person on the planet will experience it at some point in their lives to different degrees and in different ways. Now, here are the 10 things that I want you to know about grief, and they're important, okay? So 10 things. The first is that all grief is unique. There is no, There are no two griefs that are alike. Just like we are all snowflakes, we are all completely unique individuals, and yet we're all one. There is no one on this planet that will have the same grief as you because there's no one on this planet that's had the same relationship with your loved one as you have. There's no one on this planet that's had the same life experiences and the same um, being that you are because you're a completely unique person. So all grief is different. And as human beings, we can tend to judge other people We expect other people to think and feel and behave in the same ways that we do. And yet there are no two people that will do that completely alike. Even identical twins, we know, will not think and feel and experience life the same way because we are all unique and we're also molded by our environment. So again, coming back to why it's so important for us to always consider what's going on in our environment because we are not separate from our environment. We are very much evolving based on what is in our environment. Then grief is a roller coaster. So you can expect this wide range of emotions. I mean, grief is like, it's like wave after wave after wave and the emotions are up and down. Early on, it might just all feel like big, my son calls it scribble. You know, it's like whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. everything is all scribbled up. It looks like you just took a bunch of different colored spaghettis and threw them in a thing. And you can't even you can't pull apart one emotion from the other in the beginning. There are stages of grief and there are stages like this because it's not like one stage. We're going to go through this stage and then we move out of that stage and go to the next stage. It It's not like that. The stages are more like I think of a a gumball machine and they're all in there together and (laughs) you can't really it's it's not like a neat orderly thing. It's our human stages. So know that I'm using that term really loosely. It's not linear. okay? but the stages of grief think of almost flavors of grief. There's denial, anger bargaining, depression, and acceptance. So we know denial, this isn't happening. This isn't happening. I don't, this, this, I don't even understand it, but it's so far out of our experience of what we think reality is. Like this is the world that we live in, right? This is the world we're living in. And then boom, one day your loved one is not in this world. We can't even comprehend it. So we have to go through denial. There's a, this isn't happening. I don't even like you're expecting them to walk through the door and that can last for months that can last 
we'll get to timelines, but okay, anger. Again, anger is going to come and it's going to go. For me, I didn't actually feel angry for, I think anger started showing up about a year into my grief, maybe even later. I was, I was so much in denial and depression and bargaining, you know, I, I couldn't even, the anger wasn't there, but but the anger will come in. And for some people, the anger is there and that becomes like the dominant emotion. So just know whatever it is, whatever your dominant emotion is, that's totally okay. Again, everyone's grief is completely unique. And the person, a person next to you, a friend or a family member who may have lost the same person, they are gonna have their grief completely different. So one might be in denial, one might be angry, one might be in depression, and one might be in acceptance, all in different stages, okay? And then there's bargaining, trying to rewind time. I remember going backwards, not understanding why I couldn't go backwards. What do you mean? I can't, like, why couldn't rewind time just like we would on um, a VHS tape for anyone who's my age, you know what that is, but trying to go backwards, you know, we're just bargaining. Then there's depression. And with depression, I think we get it confused with, I don't even like this word of depression, because when we hear the word depression, we think, oh, someone needs to, to go to therapy, and they need antidepressants. No, depression is despair. It's hopelessness. It is not wanting to wake up. It's going, I don't even know how I'm living on this planet without this person. So depression comes and goes. Look, I'm three years out and I still, it comes, you know, it still comes. So it doesn't, and I am not depressed. So, so this is, it's a feeling of this hopelessness and this despair. And even though my eyes water up, this for me now is more of, um, it's more of a sadness. It's more of like a, God, I wish you were here. You know, it's more of like a, last night was back to school night. And I was like, you should be here with me. You know, like that's something we should do together. But, but it is what it is, right? So that's the acceptance. So then it comes finally to acceptance where you go, okay, well, it is what it is. Now, I still have a, an amazing relationship with my husband on the other side. We'll talk about that at another time. But um, the acceptance, I think sometimes we get stuck with acceptance too. And we go, well, if I accept that they are not here, and whether that's by death, whether that's by divorce, whether that's by estrangement, it's if I accept that that this person is no longer in my life, then that I'm saying that it's okay and that I'm glad that they're not in my life. That's not what acceptance is. Acceptance is I am not banging my head against a brick wall anymore and demanding that something be different from what it is. This is what it is. And so whether it's a divorce or an estrangement or a death, acceptance means I know that I can be happy. I know that I can be full of joy. I know that I can be full of love. Hi, honey. Okay, cool. And uh, no. Okay. And acceptance. And do you know why we can't watch TV? Why can't we watch TV today? It's like, you want you want to say why? I said sorry. I know. You want to let them know why? That, that means trick shot, bro. I took it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because it's a school day. So there's no screen time on school days. Okay. So, but he still tries, you know. Okay. Then um, <clears throat> there's a sixth stage that uh, the grief expert I told you about, David Kessler, he added this sixth stage and it's the most beautiful stage because if we can move through the first five stages and it doesn't mean just moving through, I really believe that grief is, it is the most powerful transformer that we have on the planet. In yoga, we have a world called tapas and tapas means heat to create change. Heating something up, it's like this idea of pain 
in order to change something. And I use the um, analogy of gold. When you melt down gold, you're purifying it, you know, to get 10 carat, 14 carat, 18 carat, 24 carat gold. You heat it up, you remove some things, and then you have kind of this more pure state. So what grief can do, because it is so incredibly painful, is when we work through the grief in a specific way using practices for our own evolvement for our own spiritual and emotional growth we can then come to the sixth stage which is finding meaning and once we find meaning we can have incredible transformation total transformation So finding meaning, it's finding meaning in the pain and it's only doing it, we can only do that when we actually allow ourselves to experience the pain. Something that people do with grief is that we wanna numb it out, of course, because it is so strong and powerful, who doesn't wanna numb it? So people drink, they eat, they eat drugs, they whatever it is to numb the pain. But if we can give ourselves permission to look at the pain and to be with our pain, to be with our grief, to schedule time with our grief and to use grief as a teacher, it becomes this beautiful, and it is this beautiful friend that helps us with our spiritual growth. We find meaning in this loss and we take that meaning and it gives us a purpose and we carry that purpose forward in ways we never would have imagined before, okay? The third thing, grief is physical. We think of grief as being this emotional thing. Heck no, grief is so freaking painful. I had no idea that my body could hurt so much from what I would think of would be emotional. And this is when I first realized, I mean, I'm a yogi. I'm a, I've been practicing yoga 25 years. I believe in the body, mind, spirit connection. I believed in it. I knew the knowledge, but I didn't experience it in the same way. So I didn't have the wisdom. Now, having gone through this experience, I have the wisdom of it. I fully understand we are not a body here, a mind here, and a soul here. We are whoosh, completely merged together. You know, we are the body, the mind, the, the soul, the energy and the environment, and they're inseparable. Grief is physical. Your body will hurt. Everything hurts. I didn't have a bowel movement for 10 days. The grief was so intense. Everything tightens up. And when we are, because we're not making it, we're powerless. We have this emotional hurt first, and then we feel so powerless. Everything tightens up. Our whole nervous system is gone on guard. What the heck is happening? Like we need to be on high alert. So the body is, the grief is physical. So we have to do things to physically release the pain from ourselves. Movement, breathing, all of that stuff. I would sit and I would just watch a candle flame. Sometimes it was, I didn't think I could breathe. You know, you're almost, the, the, the when the waves come in really strong and just sit there, I'm breathing with this candle flame. I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out. Paul Dennison has a great program. It's called Spark, I believe. And um, it's a grief yoga community. He uses yoga movement, breath, and sound to release traumas in the body. And that's a really beautiful program. If that's something that you're going through, I highly recommend that. People um, have really loved that. Oh. Hi. Okay, what goes on with our brain in grief? The brain shuts down because it there it's, it's overloaded. I want you to think of like um, you, when uh, we have an outlet and things short circuit because there's too much input coming in so the fuse blows that's what happens in grief is that our mind shuts down i call it the grief fog other other my girlfriend um michelle ann collins calls it the, the grief cocoon where um you're you go into this like cocoon honey could you eat that over there please so, so. 
we're going to have to listen to the champion, but thank you. The, the, the grief cocoon. Um, our mind doesn't work. So here's the thing. If you are early in grief, and by early grief, I'm talking like a, under a year, do less, especially especially in the beginning, do less, let other people do more. One of the beautiful gifts of grief, especially, actually, I shouldn't say especially for women, because this is for men too, is many of us grow up thinking we have to do it all ourselves. I have to do this myself. I've got to, I've got to go through this experience myself. I can carry this myself. I remember when I pulled my back because I, there was like a carpet and I was carrying, it was rolled up and I was carrying it up the stairs or down the stairs or something. And I'm like, I can do it. I can do it. Right. Trying to be this like strong woman and totally pulled my back in grief. It's the same thing that we go. I can do it. I can do it. No, don't do it. Let other people do things for you in, in early grief, our minds not functioning. And yet there are all of these logistical things that you have to get done. So take one thing a day, one thing, that's it. I would be like today, I am going to make this one phone call and a one phone call would wipe you out. Grief is exhausting. It takes up all of your energy. So you might find that, oh my gosh, you just get up and get the mail and you have to go right back to bed. Totally okay. Please don't shame yourself. Please don't guilt yourself. Please let yourself have that time. Allow other people to help you. I had a girlfriend who set up a a food train and people were leaving food at our doorsteps. I mean, I don't know how my kids ate the first six months. I honestly don't know, but people were bringing us food and everything will happen. Things will happen. If you can let people drive for you, let people drive for you. you no, know, try to do as, as little as possible. And again, everyone's grief is different. I had a sudden death. I had traumatic death. And um, so- Some people's griefs are the same. Like whose? Women, like, I guess some people. No, no, no one's griefs are exactly the same because no two people are the same and no two people have the exact same relationship. So everyone's grief is going to be a little bit different, but they might be similar. Yeah. You want to talk about your grief at all? I don't know what my grief is. Okay. We did a lot of coloring. We did a lot, a lot of drawing things. I don't know if he remembers this, but we did things like grief tic-tac-toe. So we would do tic-tac-toe and he would draw um, crying faces or there would be a crying face and there would be a happy face. I would do that. I was trying to teach him the word of grief because for children, yeah. for children, they don't know what to call it. They just know that their world is falling apart, that their adult is gone. And the other adult, if there are other adults in their lives are, are falling apart and something is really wrong and it's super scary on top, it's, it's scary. So I, was, I wanted to teach him the word of grief so he could give it a label. And so that's what we started are you doing. Are talking about me? I am. <laughs> so he did grief tic- You never talking about grief before. Grief- You never tried to? Grief tic-tac-toe, and he would draw a lot of like broken hearts. Um, there's another really amazing book called The ABCs of Grief that another one of my girlfriends wrote. It is absolutely brilliant and beautiful. If you have children who are going through grief or if you work with children who, um, I, I highly recommend it. I actually wanna buy some copies for the elementary schools in our area because it's a really beautiful book, The ABCs of Grief. Um, Okay, you want to go grab that, honey? Can you go upstairs and get that? It's in your bookshelf. And bring that down. I don't know where it is. I don't want it. Okay. <clears throat> so you're going to have the physical signs. You're going to have the changes in appetite. You'll have the changes in sleep. You'll have physical pain. You'll have extreme fatigue. And give yourself tons of grace. Drink as much water as you possibly can. I know you're not going to want to drink. You're not going to feel like drinking. You're not going to feel like eating. Or you might feel like eating overeating. But try to eat good foods, even just a little bit. Easily digested foods. And um, I did a lot of, like, I might have done smoothies. I think I just actually did like a, I don't even know but uh, and try to drink some water try to stay hydrated as best as you can and sleep as much as you need to okay don't feel guilty about it and then um and then the social reactions no so with grief you may feel completely alone not only are you 
uh, without your loved one, whether they were living with you or not, if they lived with you, it you feel their absence even more, right? So when you live with someone and they're not there, you there's nothing that you could do that would be like, people used to say to me, I don't want to say anything that's going to like upset you. And I, you know, I look around, we, I'm like, there's not a single thing in my house that doesn't remind me of my husband. And at the time too, I was also like anything that I saw that reminded me of him that I thought was a sign I had to bring into my house. So I had a good two years of bringing in tchotchke stuff, like clutter. Uh, clutter is a, is a trauma response. I learned this from a, another woman on YouTube. She's called the Crappy Childhood Fairy, and she is, um, she's brilliant. She's brilliant and uh, so helpful. And she said, clutter is a trauma response. And I would looked around my house and it was to the point people couldn't come over anymore because it was almost, you would walk in and it was like the walls were caving in on you because there was so much stuff, you know, feathers and cardinals. And I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. Flamingos, like whatever it was. So you just, um, how other people, you'll feel alone. And I understand too, bringing things into the home made me feel less alone. So you do what you do until you don't need to do it anymore. And then you can go and and donate it back to Goodwill. And then another person who's in grief will buy all of it. And you know, you kind of let it cycle through. I like, I would bless it before I give it, donate it and, and put lots of love and healing into these items and then and then donate them so that there'll be another person who goes, oh, yeah, I, I feel I feel good having having this in the home for a while. So people it will say dumb things. People will say dumb things. Oh my gosh, people say the dumbest things. And look, they don't know any better. Like I said before, people are uncomfortable with grief. We live in a grief illiterate world. So they're uncomfortable. And for some reason, people have been guilty of it too. People would rather say something than say nothing. Now being on the other end of it, we know saying nothing would be better, right? You would be perfectly happy having a friend come over and simply sitting there with you, not needing to say anything. That would be perfectly great, right? Most people don't feel comfortable doing that. So they might say something like, I had a, I have a, a neighbor whose husband passed away recently and there was someone at her church who said something like, oh, well, you're, you're, no, you're such a great catch that you, there'll be, you'll have someone else soon or something like that. And she was like, what? I mean, her husband had been gone like two weeks. I mean, it was, look, people they mean well, but they just don't know what to say. So here's the thing is don't take it on. When people say dumb things, just know that it's out of their own ignorance and their own discomfort. They might say something like, at least he's not suffering or she's not suffering anymore. Now they mean well, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't make you feel any better. And in fact, you probably go, not suffering, but I'm suffering. I want them here. You know, I don't, I don't, I'm great that they're not in pain, but I still want them here. It doesn't take away that your loved one is not here. So just know that give them some grace too. Okay. Don't carry around the resentment because we know I, we talked about resentment. I'll put a, a link to that episode. Resentment is poison. It makes all of us sick. So please don't hold on to that. It's really important that you just like catch and release, catch and release, catch and release. It comes in, you feel the resentment, you feel the first, you don't have the energy being in grief. You don't have the energy to hold on to resentment. This was one of the beautiful gifts. I have many, many, many amazing gifts that have come from grief. And I'm going to talk about more of those next week. But one of the gifts was that I couldn't hold on to anything that I didn't absolutely need. So resentments, gone. Fears, gone. Anger, gone. Judgment, 
gone because there's just no energy for it. So you use your energy for doing what you need to do in a day and for being with your grief, for healing your grief. If you have young children or any children, you use it to help your children get through the experience as well, okay? Okay. <clears throat> There's no timetable for grief. Did you find the book? No, but can I go to shop my friends? Uh, we have karate. Okay. Can I do Can I do when you're doing your class? Five minutes. What? Five minutes. For what? Go. To what? Five minutes. We have to go. Where's my friends? Yeah. I, I can go any time. Go get your gi on. I can go any time. Okay. Okay, there's no timetable in grief. That means I have to be fast. So there's no timetable. The um, the DSM-5 came up with this thing a couple of years ago that said prolonged grief was any grief that lasted over one year. Totally ridiculous, complete BS. My mentor, David Kessler, says total BS. Obviously, the people that wrote this did not have a loved one that passed and certainly didn't have a loved one that passed uh, tragically or unexpectedly, okay? So... Grief has no timetable. Your grief is going to change. It will evolve. You will have lots of moments of joy and happiness. And then this morning, last night and this morning, I had a huge wave of grief come over me. I mean, powerful where I sat in my car and I cried. And it was it was because I was at back to school night and you're with all these families. And, you know, I was having the feeling like he should be here and, um, and feeling sad for my son that has had couldn't go to back to school night. So know that it's, it is, there is no timetable and that's three years out. Okay. I, for the most part, I live with joy. My son lives with joy. My daughters live with joy. Like we, we are thriving. We are thriving and, but grief comes in waves. It's not gone. And when it comes back, it's interesting now because I actually, when it comes back, I feel it's like a long lost friend and I go, oh, hey, there you are. You know, there you are. Like, it's like, yeah, my love has changed. My grief has changed and, um, and the sadness can still be there, but it's not that devastating despair. I simply give myself permission to be with it and I do it with a lot of love, okay? So no timeline in grief. And then seeking support, get the support that you need. Um, and often it's not gonna come in our friends and our family because they might, it may, but it may not because if your friends haven't, um, aren't, aren't trained in grief or haven't experienced grief, they might not know. I found huge support in my grief community. And for the first two years, I pretty much ex relied exclusively on my grief community and a few good friends, like just a very small handful of, of people. Um, so it's important that you have that support, okay? And then having um, other things to help you cope. So that could be uh, gardening or poetry or dancing or art. Uh, it, give yourself permission to try something new, to do something that you didn't do before that's new. For me, I found huge relief and, and joy in gardening. Audrey Hepburn said, to plant a garden is to believe in tomorrow. And I fully believe that. It helped me just to put my hands in the dirt and I needed it my hands in the dirt with gloves, but hands in the dirt, being there and watching, growing something and saying, yes, there is a tomorrow. I believe in tomorrow. So whatever it is, I have another girlfriend and she's, she's painting and she's loving it and taking classes. Look, we all do different things. Um, so I want to find something. It might be walking outside in nature. It might be starting to travel. It might be, um, visiting a place that you've always wanted to go whatever it is it might be writing poetry a lot of people start writing poetry that's really cool so something that's going to help you to be able to get through the grief and to be able to work through grief in a really healthy way and then um when do you get professional help <sighs> that's a really tough one you know um because grief is normal and there's nothing, it's a normal process, you'll go through it. But if you're feeling so hopeless and so much despair, if you're feeling like you don't wanna be on the planet anymore, if you're feeling like 
um, it's been over a year and you're like, I like I literally can't drag myself out of bed or I'm um, I'm not finding there's no moments of joy because we do want moments of joy. The grief is going to change and evolve. So then that would be when it would be time to get professional and um, help. And I would definitely say to find a counselor or a therapist that is trained in um, in in grief support so like i've done extensive grief training i am not a therapist or a counselor but i i do give grief support so you can look on grief.com um and i know that there are therapists and counselors on grief.com you could also go to psychology today and but find someone who is that's their that's what what they're trained in their specialty in grief support okay and you can even go to finding if you have the loss of a child or if you have the loss of a spouse or if you have a loss by suicide or a loss of a parent that you can find counselors and therapists and and grief support uh, grief coaches and peer to peer support spe for specific for the loss that you may have experienced and find that helpful okay. And then hope and healing now. Our grief evolves as we evolve. And there is healing. Like I said earlier, grief is, uh, today is just a day, isn't it? It's kind of like lots of, lots of, um, <laughs> lots of stuff going on here. But grief is called the great transformer because it is so incredibly powerful. If you work through grief in ways, you give yourself permission to be with your grief. Don't avoid it. Don't run away from the pain, but you might schedule it. I, I don't remember if I said this, but about eight months into my grief, I had to start scheduling. My kids all told me, my three children in different ways, mom, we need you here. Like you're too much into your grief and we actually need you to be right here, like with our family right now in the land of the living. So at that point I started scheduling my grief and making sure that I wasn't giving grief time when it should be family time. So. It's not that I didn't have grief, I still had grief, but it became more compartmentalized rather than being blanketed in grief. So know that there is hope and there is healing. We will do an episode in the afterlife. What, Whatever your faith is, you may start to explore, what do I believe? What happens after we die? What are we? at our essence, is this all that it, there is? I know for me, my grief was so powerful. And I know that when I saw my husband's body and I kissed his cold lips, I knew that that was not him. That is not him. That is not his essence. That is his shell. That is the body. That is not what we are. That is, this is, there is more to life than what we see right here. You don't need to believe that. For me, this was hugely powerful and hugely healing and propelled my life in a completely different direction. I say we're thriving, but anger comes and goes. So with that being said, hope and healing. Let yourself heal. Give yourself as much grace and compassion and love as you can. Always, always, always just do less allow the day to be the day that would be the mantra the day is going to be the day today is going to be the day i'm allowing the day to be the day we'll talk again next week i'll go more into the lessons of grief the life lessons that i've experienced um, and that you may be experiencing as well as what to do on things like special days and really let that be a mantra just allow the day to be the day Okay, I'll see you next week. I hope this was helpful. And I know that we had a lot of interruptions, but this is life. And I really wanted the Healthy Human Project to be about how are everyday people finding healing? How are we elevating ourselves? How are we bringing health and healing to ourselves and to our families? Because I'm not in this family by myself, clearly, right? I, there's a whole lot going on. So how can I show up to be my best self? How can I help those around me to be their best selves? And how can I somehow spread that to people like you and and letting that grow so that we as human beings can start to thrive and uh, make the world a better place one person one light one piece of rice at a time all right thank you so much love and light and i will see you next week